Hey everyone, today I wanted to share with you a few ways where nutrition and health meet. So with that, uh, we're going to talk about the breeding herd, nursery pigs, finishing pigs, uh, body condition, energy, amino acids, fat, uh, even yucca extract, uh, feed intake in the nursery, and um, energy and amino acids on tail biting, xylanase, organic acids, and finally pellets and meal diets okay so the classic one body condition right so we talked about it in other situations here in the channel uh thin cells easy to identify fat cells not as easy for someone that's untrained so make sure you don't have fat cells because that's going to increase um preventive mortality based on dr nauer's data they are from north carolina state university the next one is uh, bump feeding. So if the sows are fat, you give more feed, uh, you're going to increase a uh, stillborn. Um, be, and that's coming from the energy, not from the amino acids. So that's about 2% stillborn, which is quite a bit. The other one is lysine levels during gestation. In guilts, not in sows, but we increase lysine levels a little bit in, um, in um, gestation, uh, you can reduce uh, stillborns, okay? So that is... Indeed, uh, very interesting when uh, you run the economics. Um, Dr. Laurie Thomas ran the economics on that, and basically, uh, it's going to depend on the economic scenario, of course. But my recommendation is if you are about 13 grams of digestible lysine a day, you're probably on a good spot. If you're closer to 11 grams, it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a push. And then now we go back to 1981, uh, Dr. Pettigrew ran some interesting studies there on the amount of fat. So uh, just the amount of fat for that uh, added in the diet. So remember, two different things here. One is a fat sow, that's not good. Now it's an ideally conditioned sow, conditioned sow that you are adding a little bit of fat uh, or quite a bit depending on the, on the, on the part of the study here, We're basically in herds that had high perineal mortality, when we added fat um, in the gestation diet, in late gestation, he was able to improve that perineal mortality by about 4%, which is quite a bit. Uh, in herds that had good mortality or moderate mortality, if you will, so below 20% perineal mortality, that was not a lot of impact there, okay? But the question is, what about today's pigs that they are leaner and higher leader size? Would that effect uh, be more, more interesting than even in the past? So that's a call for the researchers uh, there uh, to run some more uh, recent studies on this area. So then Dr. Pettigrew looked at how many kilograms of fat each sow would have to consume in late gestation to be able to improve that prune mortality. And the sweet spot was around two to four kilograms of fat per sow consumed. It didn't matter if it was like a few days before um, farrowing or like the last third of gestation, okay? Um, of course, there's, there are practical uh, considerations there and the implementation of this, uh, of this um, research result. Um, you know, feed lines and um, flow ability uh, could be a challenge if, if you are adding a lot of fat there, okay? So keep that in mind, but again, it's a call to the researchers uh, and for the innovators out there. Then you have uh, yucca extract, which is not something we see a lot in diets, honestly, uh, but there's been several studies and um, 125 ppm of yucca extract during gestation reduced stillborns in 0.4. Uh, pigs, so divide that by say uh, 15, um, 15 total born, that's what, 3% or so. Uh, so it's interesting, somewhat consistent results there. Um, I would like to see a few more studies, larger scale there, and also the economics before implementing it. But that's another interesting uh, opportunity there. Now we transition to the nursery and we go all the way back to 1998. Uh, Dr. Madak from France, he ran a study across 106 farms and he observed that pigs that didn't eat very well in that first uh, week, uh, they had more diarrhea, increased the odds ratio there, so the chance 
of having diarrhea. So you wanna make sure that the pigs are eating more than 400 grams uh, on that first week, okay? Then another situation there in the nursery, you wanna make sure you're finding those pigs that are not eating after a few days, say two days after weaning. Don't go for the small ones only, you're gonna have medium and heavy pigs that are not uh, eating, okay? So now let's look at uh, a study from Wes uh, Schwerer in 2017 from um, Iowa State University. And uh, he looked at several options to replace antibiotics. And the first take home message there for me was that about 90% of the studies were not um, reporting mortality. So this is a call for folks that conduct research here report the mortality even if it's a smaller study and you're not going to see a uh, statistical difference someone later can do a meta-analysis and come up with a with a conclusion there um, so we need to report that but for every, everything he saw a lot of these replacements were not able to improve mortality and um, for example organic acid about half of the time uh, from those studies were able to improve mortality a little bit. So that, that was something interesting there. Now transitioning to the finishing period, we ran a study a few years back where uh, there were seven uh, levels of energy and by consequence fiber as well. And when we went below um, 2.3 um, megacal of net energy per, uh, per kilogram, uh, which is not as common in, in the Americas, uh, more, uh, more common uh, in Asia to go that low of an energy. Uh, sometimes in Europe, but, but I've seen only Asia really with that low of a energy level. But So uh, mortality and, and removal rate was increased. And then when we went all the way up to uh, you know, corn soy, 4% fat or so, then uh, there was a slight increase in mortality as well, okay? So basically avoiding the super extremes in energy uh, is probably a good thing, okay? And then we looked at the percentage of vices or the incidence of vices and um, again, on the lower you go to the energy of the diet, there's an increase there in vices as well as um, if you go too high, there was also increase, but the lower energy was really um, was really the more important. Those were in this study. This part of the study was actually uh, numer only numerical differences, but it does match with a, a few other studies we are uh, aware of. Uh, with Dr. Fraser and others, they did an interesting study. They had um, cotton cords where they um, they soaked it in blood or or water, if, if you will, and then uh, basically the pigs that were deficient in protein, they were attracted to the blood, okay? So this is uh, somewhat of an evidence that um, protein deficient diets could in, uh, increase the risk of vices or, or tail biting, even though we do not have good evidence um, on, on, very, on design studies. Of course, it's a hard study to conduct, because the small or the rare, if you will, incidence of, um, of tail biting, right? If you run a study like that, uh, you may have tail biting or may not because of the multifactorial nature of the problem. And also you may have only a few pens, which make it even, makes it harder to, um, to even uh, get any statistical significance there. Now looking at um, xylanase, um, Basically, there's been probably around 20 studies in the last few years in, in the United States and um, some variation there, as you'd expect. Uh, for some folks um, that observed uh, differences, which I believe was probably 10 or 12 studies or so that observed differences, um, probably around 1% to 2% uh, in improvement in mortality. So you can keep that in mind as well. And then in 2015, Dr. John DeYoung at, at K-State at the time, uh, he looked at uh, pelletine versus meal and how that affects um, ulcers basically. And when you pellet the diet, uh, it increases ulcers, okay? 
and so he had treatments where it was mu all the way through, palate all the way through, mu early, palate later uh, in the finishing period, or palate in the first half of the finishing, and then mu in the in the second half, and also rotating palate and mu every two weeks. So <clears throat> basically, that was because. Uh, some feed mules don't have the ability to pellet all the diets, so that was a little bit of the question that was being answered there. And basically, when um, you pellet, like I said, increase ulcer, but in the last two weeks, for example, if you provide a mash feed, uh, that ulcers um, get better, as well as if you provide mash feed in the last uh, second, of, uh, second half of the finishing period, okay? And then, an interesting study from 2012 from Dr. Dean Boyd, basically he looked at herbs with um, health challenge and, and um, low health challenge uh, versus high, and then basically uh, pellet versus mu, and then two um, genetic lines, so it was a factorial, right, uh, from that regard, and basically uh, if you have good health herbs or flows, the negative effects of pellet immortality is is not going to be super high. It's going to be around 1% or so, okay? So take that in consideration. However, in bad quality herds or flows, a pellet's going to have a, a drastic increase in mortality of several percentage points or even, even more, okay? And then depending on the genetic line, this magnitude of, of this effect can be even, even greater. Finally, out of feed events, so we always try to avoid those. Those could cause, cause some ulcers as well, as well as torsions. So keep that in mind. So the implementation of that feeding program is even more important than the feeding, feeding program itself, because if you have a great feeding program that's not being delivered to the pigs, then uh, it's useless. So with that, if you like the video, give us a like and subscribe to the channel and also feel free to comment below and let's have a conversation. Stay in touch. Yeah.